Without further ado, uh, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, uh, the McDonald Laurier Institute, and uh, the Free Thinking Film Society give you Michael Weiss and Juliana Temerazi in conversation with our friend Terry Glavin. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks everybody for coming, and um, thanks to Ju Juliana and Michael for uh, agreeing to do this. Um, I thought what we would do is we would start by looking at the sort of broader picture of events and developments in the Middle East and drilling fairly deeply down into the granular almost immediately and then sort of working back and filling in the blanks a little bit. But before, before that, there, I, I'd like, if I might ask Michael, uh, to give us just a brief sort of report from the front, sort of developments in the last few days, particularly uh, Fallujah has been in the news, uh, the events in Syria, the government's refusal uh, of the United Nations, food drops in Daria and other places. Uh, so just uh, give us a shot, take a shot at that. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for, for hosting this event um, and, and uh, bringing me to Ottawa. Um, so as you know, this, this war now is about two years old. It was <coughs> launched in July of 2014. And there's certainly been progress made on the ground against ISIS, uh, which has been driven out of several cities and towns, um, especially uh, Ramadi, which is the you know, a major provincial capital that they managed to sack about almost a year uh, into the war. So it looked like they were still on the, the front foot making, you know, momentum was on their side. Now the, the error, I would say, of their mantra remaining and expanding, the nation-building project of the Islamic State is at an end. Uh, and the era of retrenchment and also the exportation of jihad, what I've called the Jihadist International, is being inaugurated. Um, what I'm seeing actually is a, a, a new phase of ISIS. This is an organization that's been around for 13 years. It used to be Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and it has undergone several transformations or metamorphoses. The, the, the most current one, to, to my mind, is the Europeanization of ISIS. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But just to give you a battlefield update, yeah. um, I focused uh, mainly on two centers of gravity. One is, is Fallujah, which is um, you know, a major city, a sinecure of, of Sunni insurgency dating back to 2003 when the U.S. invaded. Uh, this is kind of the hornet's nest, if you like, of people who don't like whoever the ruling uh, figure or regime in Baghdad is, whether it's the U.S. Uh, uh, coalition provincial authority, or the Maliki government, or now the al Abadi government. Uh, and the problem with the battle in Fallujah is, well, there are many problems. Uh, number one, just to give you a, a, the, an order of battle, on the Iraqi government side is 20,000 fighters. Um, some of them are in the Iraqi security forces. Some of them are quite professional and good, like the Golden Division, which is their elite counterterrorism crack team. Uh, and, but the, the majority, or at least the majority that has arrayed, been arrayed around Fallujah in the suburbs and outlying uh, villages, are what's known as the Popular Mobilization Units. This is a broad consortium of militias, paramilitary groups. A great number of them are essentially Iranian proxies, created wholly owned subsidiaries of the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran. Um, the de facto leader of the PMUs is a guy called Hadi al Amri. He's a former transport minister in Iraq. Um, he is the head of the uh, Badr Corps or Badr organization, which is a very powerful militia with a, a huge political constituency. And he's most famous, perhaps, by being an Iraqi national who, during the Iran-Iraq war, fought on the side of Iran. There's video footage of him on the battlefield leading the soldiers of Ayatollah Khomeini into battle against Saddam's regime. So it'd sort of be like Benedict Arnold fighting, you know, uh, in, in the War of 1812, basically, if he had survived. Um, very fascinating, just the, the, the sectarian dynamics at play in Iraq. The problem with Fallujah is Sunnis in Fallujah do not want to be liberated, quote unquote, by an, an army of Shia jihadists or Shia Islamists. Uh, this has been the central tension of the war. The coalition, such as it is, is relying very heavily on a strictly counterterrorism platform. They're not thinking geostrategically. They're not thinking about the cohesion or integrity of the Iraqi state, whatever's left of it at this point. And we'll talk about the balkanization uh, from below of, of this country. Um, and inside Fallujah, you have no more than 1,000 ISIS fighters. It's probably closer to 700 or 800. You have between 50,000 and 90,000 civilians. 
many of whom are being held as collective human shields by ISIS. Anyone who tries to flee is being sniped and shot by ISIS uh, because ISIS realizes if they have a city of almost 100,000 people, they can, they're holding everybody hostage. So this, this battle has ground to a halt. There's been some minor progress uh, in the southern uh, entry point to Fallujah where the coalition has been uh, waging airstrikes. But the popular mobilization units have committed to staying only in the outlying suburbs. Now that might sound like a viable plan, but for the fact that these guys have now committed war crimes. So the Daily Beast uh, published a piece yesterday um, Sunni sheikhs and tribal leaders say that 700 uh, or, or 800 uh, Sunni Arabs have been kidnapped and tortured or, or have gone missing. And they're, many are suspected actually <coughs> to have been buried alive by these popular mobilization units, which are seen by many Sunnis as basically Daesh or ISIS just from the other side, the other confessional sect. Um, this is the problem. Uh, in Syria, we have a similar problem, albeit one that I think is a little more salvageable, at least in the short term. What the United States has done, it has empowered um, Syrian Kurds, but a particular political faction of Syrian Kurds uh, known as the Democratic Union. There's an alphabet soup in the Middle East. I won't belabor it or bore you with, with all the acronyms, but suffice to say, those Kurds are the PKK, which is a US designated Turkish designated terrorist organization. That said, they, nobody has been better at fighting ISIS than the PKK. The PKK liberated Sinjar. Uh, the PKK saved the Yazidis, or at least did the, did the most work to save the Yazidis. It wasn't the Kurdish Peshmerga of Iraq, although there has been a lot of mysticism and, and mythology that's risen up about them. Um, so the PKK are seen as, as great freedom fighters. A lot of Western volunteers, like the, you know, the, the, the international brigades in the Spanish Civil War have gone off to fight with them against the <coughs> jihadi menace. The problem is, though, the Kurds of Syria are a minority. Uh, and the, the minority cannot purport or, tr or, or, or succeed in liberating the majority from ISIS rule. So Raqqa city, which is the, essentially the capital of the, the caliphate, um, is held by ISIS and has been held by ISIS since about 2013. Uh, don't know what the population numbers of Raqqa are anymore because there are a lot of internally displaced. But Sunni Arabs are actually joining ISIS in fear of being conquered by the Kurds. Now this is very difficult for the Western imagination to wrap itself, its head around, right? Why would anyone not want to be conquered by the secular US-backed Kurds and still continue to live under barbaric, takfiri, Islamist rule? Well, it's because there's a politics to this part of the world. You know, we, we try to fetishize the religious fundamentalism, the messianic, you know, ap the apocalypse will be ushered in in a town called Dabek and all that. Yeah, I, uh, that's the marketing, that's the window dressing. But at the end of the day, the people who have empowered ISIS, who have given ISIS its, its, its swath of territory, who are <coughs> paying money into ISIS's coffers, are ordinary people who see them as an alternative to all the other alternatives, or they see them as the best alternative, I should say. Whether it's Bashar al-Assad's totalitarian regime, which has killed the majority of the 470,000 deaths in Syria, or people who have been murdered in Syria, or if it's the, the uh, Iraqi central government, which is increasingly seen as a suzerainty or a, a satrapy of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and, and a, 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 an exponent of a Shia chauvinism that most Sunni Arabs bridle at. So this is the problem. There are briar patches uh, of the Middle East, particularly in eastern Syria, western and central Iraq, where ISIS and the ideology and just the political pragmatism, quote unquote pragmatism, thrives. And those briar patches are still very much in, in ISIS's control. And I don't see uh, very much progress being made to, to expunge ISIS. The only way you can ultimately defeat Sunni Jihad is with Sunnis. We've seen this. This is not theoretical. We saw this in the mid-2000s with the Al Anbar awakening. And again, that was not, don't romanticize that either. You had people who on Tuesday were taking tea with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and on Wednesday were running up to the Americans saying, give us weapons, give us ammunition, give us air support, because we want to drive these bastards out of town. They're raping our women, they're beheading our sheikhs, and they're stealing all the money. So until you see that groundswell opinion turn against ISIS from within its own constituency, within these briar patches, you're not going to be able to say that we're effectively winning the war. We're shrinking the caliphate, but we're not destroying it. Um, and just on a final point, and just to give you a sense of, of how ad hoc all of this is, I've done 
I've done work on Syria far longer than I've done work on Iraq, and I know quite a few Syrian activists and, and rebel groups, and I was a proponent of intervening in Syria in the early days, 2012. I went to Aleppo. I saw the, 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 the city in the northeastern corridor of Aleppo being taken from the regime. Um, you know, my last name is Weiss. I was surrounded by Syrian Arab Muslims. I didn't feel like I was going to lose my head. Uh, figuratively or literally. Uh, I was welcomed by young kids with engineer, engineering degrees or degrees in communication, many of whom spoke English. I said, what do you want? They said, we want to build a country like Tunisia or Turkey or even the United States. So there was a, 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 a this, this history cannot be rewritten or elided by the fact that we're now talking about black clad headloppers, you know, who are crucifying people in the Middle East. There was a very powerful democratic ferment in this country and it was extinguished by the Assad regime. And one of the, the catalysts for, for, for its being extinguished, un unfortunately, was the absence of any kind of US leadership or a drive to protect people. And again, one of the, 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 the ISIS narratives is there is a global conspiracy. And is a conspiracy being led by the United States and Russia, backed by the, the Rafida, which is the bigoted term Sunni chauvinists and jihadists use to describe all Shia, uh, and the Nusairis, which is the term they refer to uh, the Alawites of Syria. So Assad, Iran, and the United States and Russia against all Sunni Muslims. Right? It doesn't matter if you're a believing Sunni Muslim, if you're insufficiently pious, uh, if you're an apostate. It's all Sunni Islam that is at war now with this Western-led coalition. And I have to say, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, in the, the imagination and the minds of the, the majority population of the Middle East to cleave this conspiracy theory away from just US foreign policy. We are deconflicting with Russia and Syria for the purposes of bombing only Sunni extremists, but not tackling the IRGC and the, the sectarian proxies oh, fighting for Assad. You know, when it comes to Iran, the President of the United States talks about respecting their equities. Well, what does that mean? It means ethnic cleansing. It means burning people alive. You don't see that on CNN because only ISIS exhibits its own atrocities. But these, there are very many groups and non-state actors or para-state actors in the region that are doing everything that ISIS does and more. And they have a higher death toll to their credit. Uh, and this is the problem. There is a sociological or a political underlay to all of this. You know, extract the messianic, the religious component, and it's just basic human calculations. People are joining ISIS for the money, because you can make a comparatively good wage, uh, it, especially if you're in the Jazeera or the eastern desert region of, of, of Syria. They're joining it because they see ISIS as a bulwark and as custodian of Sunni Islam. Not the ideology, but the fact that this is a, an Islamic state that is protecting or purports to protect all Sunnis. And all the barbarism, all the terror, all everything that you've seen, none of that can be discounted either. But until the West understands the, the geostrategic implications of how it's fighting this war and the unintended consequences of this war, creating competitive, rising competitive sectarian nationalisms, which once ISIS is dis destroyed or defeated, are going to lead to even greater sideshow conflicts. I'm afraid you know, the, 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 the reason that you see a, an organization like this thrive and persist that has never been adequately okay. addressed. That, that's what we're going to, we'll turn yeah. to that in a minute. Um, the involvement of the largely NATO member coalition um, that began as an air power effort and now involves uh, 300 Canadian special operations uh, uh, advise and assist troops in northern Iraq. It all started uh, with Sinjar. Um, it wasn't just a matter of uh, ISIS roaring across the Nineveh plain and threatening American interests in Erbil. When the world's attention was focused on the thousands of Yazidis who were pouring out of the Shingal range, and particularly the, the isolation and the encirclement of those hundreds of Yazidis on Mount Sinjar, uh, it seems to me it's fair to say that the world was shamed into acting. And uh, there was great support from getting sort of mobilized behind the American uh, coalition. And that's where things uh, in NATO, that's where it all kicked off. So the world was kind of introduced to the Yazidis at that moment. But there are a number of other minority groups in uh, the region that we don't hear, in my view, enough about. And uh, so if I may, if Juliana could give us a little bit of an overview 
uh, uh, of, of where the minority groups uh, uh, sort of situate themselves in these broader struggles within which they find themselves caught up. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you once again for inviting me, and uh, it's an honor to be among all of you. Uh, the Northern, there are two regions that we're talking about. We're talking about Iraq and we're talking about Syria. The group that mainly people just talk about is the Christians of Iraq and Christians of Syria. But we're not just a religious group, we're a minority group, an ethnic group, which means that we have a history. We have our own language and our culture, and that is called the Assyrians. The Assyrians are the children of Nineveh. Uh, our history is over 6,700 years. And the capital, Nineveh, fell to the Babylonians in really four centuries before Christ. So since then, we've really lived at the mercy of our overlords. Whoever came along, they persecuted us. And the majority of the persecution started with the rise of Islam. Um, since 14 centuries ago, we have paid a heavy, heavy price for being Christians. We are the first uh, group as a nation, collectively, to convert to Christianity through St. Thomas the Apostle. Uh, our churches have been bombed and destroyed and burned down. Our clergy have been beheaded. Our men and women have been Islamified or even Kurdified in this case. Um, many of you have heard of the Armenian Genocide in 1914. The Assyrians, two-thirds of the Assyrians were killed in that time frame as well. My own great-grandfather died in a camp in Ormia. My great-grandmother, along with two of her sisters, were kidnapped and killed by the Kurds. And that's something, and I see your faces, that's something that is shocking, that people didn't know about that. And fast forward to 2003, um, majority of the Assyrians across the world supported the invasion of Iraq because we thought as America helped the Kurds have their own uh, autonomous region, that they would help us as well to have Nineveh. During the 1914 through 1918, and even through 1923 and 22, England promised that to us. In, uh, in exchange for our allegiance and fighting for the queen, um, and also fighting for Russia, but we were let down. Uh, we were betrayed in that form, and we thought the American, American policy now will come to our aid and help us have a homeland that is rightfully ours, very much like Zionism. We actually, as an Assyrian nation, we're a big fan of Zionist movement, and we're now, truly, my friends, it is our only time we as Assyrians believe, this is our only time to have a homeland. In a very demented and sick way, ISIS has brought a lot of us Assyrians together, um, united us and in, in Iraq. And we, we're going to talk about that later today, uh, but we want a province of our own taking the model of Zionism. Now that's northern Iraq. Syria, the Christ so there are um, a large number of Christians that have been displaced in Syria who are not Assyrians by ethnicity. Our number of the Assyrians that um, have fled, that fled Iraq, they settled along Khabur River, which is in the northeast part of Syria. And ISIS wreaked havoc um, against the Assyrians there. They, in fact, I don't know if you recall, they, in fact, uh, kidnapped 250 Assyrians from 35 villages. And our bishop on the ground in Syria was able to negotiate and free these individuals. But so why do we have majority of Assyrians now living in Syria was because of the atrocities committed by the Kurds and by the newly formed Iraqi government in 1933, when from northern Iraq they fled to Syria and now we're displaced again. So I'm trying to draw this picture for you. Just take me as an example. My great grandfather, if we were able to, I was able to uh, go back in my own heritage, in my own family history to only late 1700s, because all the documents have been burned down in churches, all the baptismal paperwork have been uh, burned down. So I don't know um, if we lived in southern Turkey, if we, um, where we came from, but we know our roots are in northern Iraq. My great-grandfather um, fled to, uh, came to America, was educated in America, went back and died there. His daughter fled from Iran to Russia, where she settled in Georgia. Then Stalinism, the Bolsheviks came in. They uh, took the men to gulag camps in my family. My family, the women in the family, then migrated to Iran. Just imagine the displacement of over, of every generation, what we've been through. And then my father fled Iran 25 years ago, taking me and my brother and my sister out. 
Um, God willing, we will remain in America and um, we have found a home. However, our spiritual home and many of our friends here are Jewish. Imagine Jerusalem. Jerusalem is very meaningful for every Jew in the world. You always said next year in Jerusalem, correct? For us, Nineveh is that spiritual place. It's not just geography. It's a spiritual location. And because that's our ancestral homeland, because we feel that uh, we know that the Pishmarga, whom you talked about, there's a mysticism about these brave Kurds who are liberating everybody and they're protecting everybody, yet they betrayed us over and over again for decades, especially two weeks before ISIS attacked, they disarmed Christians in northern Iraq. They disarmed Yazidis, and we have documentation that we've turned over to the State Department to show the atrocities that the Kurds have committed against us. Um, and then Iraqi forces have failed us gravely. So who will protect our own? Who will protect the Yazidis better than their own kind? Um, where can we really survive as an Assyrian, as the Yazidis, but on their own land? Um, something that I need to clarify here, when, you, when people call us as Christians, we as Christians come to the West and we see a cross on a building and we rush to it. We pledge allegiance to that church and we live in that church and we can thrive very easily. Canada has been very kind to the Christians of the Middle East, so we can thrive here. But what is missing, and many Jews have told me this as well, is the, the factor of assimilation. So we lose our ethnicity. We lose our Aramaic language that is thousands of years old. We become can, uh, members of Canadian, we become Canadian citizens, we become Swedish, we become American, and our children then, they lose that pride of being Aramaic speaking or Assyrian speaking. So this is why we are starting to appeal to the world that this is our last chance. We as Assyrians believe if we don't have friends such as yourselves, uh, Canadian government, uh, American government, European parliament, if we don't have you coming along our side, not just as Christians, really, more importantly, as a minority group, as an ethnic group that really is on the verge of extinction, in a hundred years from now, scholars have told us, you will not, you will cease to exist. And that's why it is such an important opportunity for me to be here to really inform you because a lot of it uh, goes on, uh, either falls on deaf ear or people just don't know about this. When we approach the evangelicals in uh, America and we talk to them about this, um, or just not just evangelicals, Catholics and any uh, other individual, they say, yeah, we know. We know what you're going through and we'll pray for you. We don't know what else to do because it's such a big issue, we're not gonna take up arm and go fighting. So all we'll do, we'll resort to prayer, but my friends, prayer needs to lead needs to lead to actions, concrete actions, because the human suffering is immense. I came back from Iraq three months ago. I visited Jordan twice last year, late last year. I cannot tell, in fact, uh, Brittany, who's here, Brittany Lawrence, who visited with me Jordan, uh, the, Jor the Christians who have been displaced in Jordan. Um, the human suffering is immense, truly. When you look in, the ch in these children's eyes who have mysteriously been inflicted with cancer and there is no hope. They, today, this child, Annabelle, was diagnosed by, with, ca with cancer. The next day, ISIS attacked. The family was displaced. Imagine this. She tra traveled to Dahuk, then to Amman, suffering from cancer. Women dying of breast cancer. There's not enough medicine that is getting to them. Men are dying of colon cancer. This is just one aspect. This is just from an illness perspective that I'm talking to you about. Education is not being provided to these kids. And the Assyrians of Iraq were of the upper echelon group, citizens, that lived there. Today, they don't have anything left. Imagine, my friends, ladies in the room, losing everything you've ever built as a home, watching your husband slipping, slipping really in depression because he failed to defend you because he was disarmed by the Kurds, and then ISIS attacks, and then his sister was raped in front of his eyes, and his brother-in-law was beheaded in front of them. 
That's what these people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Um, Mike, if you could address just briefly before you, we get into a, a sort of home stretch here, um, the prospects for a kind of decentralized federal Iraq that would allow um, an Assyrian homeland. I know there have been similar discussions uh, among Sunnis for a kind of a Sunni enclave mm. within Iraq, which sounds kind of odd. Um, but if you could give us a sense of, I, I guess uh, we'll call it for the Mike, Mike Doran thesis, for want of a better way of describing it. Michael Doran is with the Brookings Institution. There are a number of other people around uh, Michael Weiss among them who have sort of said, wait a minute, American foreign policy in the region over the past decade or so isn't just random weirdness or incompetence and stuff that we might be happy about or, you know, isolationism and realism and, you know, you can't really think of it in those terms. There's actually something else going on. There's a kind of a method to the American foreign policy that we haven't really been focusing on. And I'm going to put it crudely as the kind of substitution of American influence in the Middle East with Iranian hegemony. I'd like you to address that. And I'd also like perhaps both of you to talk a little bit about where you see American foreign policy going in light of the upcoming uh, election and the, um, you know, the dog-faced boy and the bearded lady and all of the <laughs> interesting things that have been happening in America land lately. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's now, and again, you know, this is where the ISIS propaganda and the ISIS conspiracy theory runs into mounting empirical evidence that, in fact, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not quite as they put it, of course. It's not the U.S. is, you know, in, uh, in league with Iran to dispossess and marginalize and murder all Sunnis. But the president himself has said he would like to create equilibrium in the region by more or less allowing Iran to rise to a level that's almost concomitant with that of, of Saudi Arabia. Um, and we've seen the president confirm this through Goldberg. Through interview various and interviews and ben profiles. Rose. Yeah, exactly. And, and I can tell you, people in his administration firmly believe that uh, all will be well in the Middle East if only we swap Riyadh with Tehran. Um, the, the logic being, well, look, the Revolutionary Guard, they're, they're great counterinsurgents. They're great counterterrorists. And they, they really get their house in order. Qasem Soleimani, I mean, there's a no-kill order issued by the White House on this guy. This, this guy is the Iranian spy master, almost single-handedly responsible for about 20% of American casualties in Iraq. People think we were fighting a war only against Al-Qaeda. We weren't. David Petraeus wrote to the Defense Secretary Bob Gates, I'm strongly considering telling the President Bush at the time that America is at war with Iran in Iraq. Um, and the popular belief among many Sunnis is that the U.S. Stupidly invaded this country, uh, knocked out a, a horrible totalitarian regime in the form of Saddam Hussein's uh, Baathism, but handed the country to Iran on a silver platter. And as a result, whether by accident or design, but increasingly seemingly by design, the Obama administration realizes that Iranian hegemony is here to stay and if not trying to further it actively, then make an accommodation with it. So this is what I mean about respecting Iranian equities in Syria, not allowing um, Pentagon-trained Syrian rebels who are tasked with fighting ISIS to take up arms or to use their skill set, courtesy of DOD, to go fight anyone else, including um, the Assad Syrian Arab army, whatever's left of it, because I think it's largely a spent force, but primarily the IRGC the National Defense Force, which is an IRGC-created consortium of sectarian militias fighting for Assad in Syria, Lebanese Hezbollah. Um, so there are all these red lines that are put on trying to do what has been U.S. policy since 1979, which is containment of Iran. And you, know, you can argue this almost any which way, on a liberal interventionist uh, basis, on a neoconservative basis, on a, <laughs> on a Kissingerian realist basis. <coughs> but if America's enemy or its adversary in the region is Iran, then knocking out Bashar al-Assad would be a net plus for U.S. interests. And even if Syria goes to hell, if it becomes a Congo on the Mediterranean, well, <coughs> our allies and our frenemies in the region principally Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, and Jordan, will be there to pick up the pieces just because of the sheer demographics. It's a Sunni majority country, and therefore the population will tilt in that direction. None of this was done, and again, it was uh, so many excuses and, and reasons for why it wasn't done. Um, you know, the, the hangover of the Iraq war, and you know, let's stay away from nation building. 
the botched or bungled Libya intervention, uh, increasingly, you know, increased disillusionment among the American electorate with foreign adventurism, wars abroad, or any kind of interventionism for that matter. But again, you know, politics is about perception, and particularly in this part of the world where America is not seen as a great shining beacon on a hill or a savior. Um, right now, it is seen actively as, as an agent of sectarianism, which is really almost unprecedented. It's why I keep banging on about we're in a more dangerous position now than we were either prior to or immediately after 9-11. Um, because all of our friends, our allies, our aspirational proxies, in a sense, don't trust us. And I'll, let me just give you a, an anecdote. And I, I'm kind of skirting your question, but I, I will address it. Just to, to show you how, um, you know, on, on, a, on a strategic basis, it's about you know making a deal with Iran, rapprochement, bringing Iran in from the cold. But on a tactical basis, it's all just improvisation, ad hoc, you know, proxy war here, bomb there, this kind of thing. There, is, there are still um, rebel groups in Syria, Sunni Arab groups that want to fight ISIS, and they also want to fight Assad. Um, they're not jihadists. If they are, are operationally marbled with the Al-Qaeda groups, it's not because of ideological loyalty. It's just because of the, the battlefield dynamics, which are very complicated. Um, one of them reached out to me uh, last week. They're in a town called Maria in Aleppo, northeast Syria, northern Syria, rather. Uh, and Maria is important because uh, it, it, it's sort of at the, literally at the front line of where ISIS is in, in Aleppo. Uh, so these are Free Syrian Army rebels fighting ISIS. On their uh, western flank is the Kurds, the US-backed Syrian Democratic Forces. These rebels, called the Mutasim Brigade, they're backed by the Pentagon. So you have one fief of the Pentagon in the form of the Syrian Democratic Forces ranged against another fief of the Pentagon. So the US is waging a proxy war against itself in Syria. These guys called me up and they say, Mike, we, we've been trained by the Pentagon in Turkey. Uh, we've never let any of our weapons or supplies go missing. We haven't sold anything to Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the Al-Qaeda franchise. But the weapons resupplies have stopped. And he said, this is a problem because now we're facing 1,000 ISIS militants. I said, hang on. You're facing 1,000 ISIS militants on your eastern flank? He said, yeah. I said, that's how many guys are holding Fallujah against 20,000 pro-Iraqi government forces? He said, yeah. I said, how many are you? He said, 400. I said, so you're 400 guys holding this town of Maria against 1,000 conquering ISIS jihad? He said, yeah, and the US hasn't given you anything. He said, no. I called the Pentagon, Central Command. I said, are these your guys? Oh, we'll have to get back to you on that. So you don't even know who your own assets are in Syria? I wait 24 hours, gets back to me, confirmed. Yes, we have trained them in the train and equip program. Yes, they are vetted and trusted. And yes, we have supplied them with weaponry, ammunition, and so on. I said, and why did you stop? I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Calls me back. Uh, we haven't stopped. I said, we were a constant stream of resupplies. It has been over a week. These guys are facing 1,000 jihadists, and they haven't gotten anything. And they, you can't run a convoy of resupplies in, because ISIS has encircled them and interdicted the road from Azaz and the border to Maria. They want an airdrop of supplies. Get back to you. Calls me back again. This is now 72 hours later. We're doing everything we can to get them the weapon. What we want to stress, we haven't stopped it. And if, if, if there's been any delay, it's because of bad weather or you know, the, the, the fight has been taken elsewhere for the time being. As I'm clicking publish on the story, uh, Mustafa contacts me on Facebook. He says, Mike, the Pentagon just called. And they're going to airdrop supplies to us within three hours. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Story goes up. Within half an hour, I get a photograph of an airdropped cargo, uh, you know, pieces of cargo with the parachute still on it. And these guys are standing there like this. And they say, we want to name a brigade after you, Michael Weiss, because you got the US government to drop supplies so we can defeat ISIS. Four days later, I'm not kidding. I'll show you a map. Four days later, these guys, two things have happened. These guys have taken nine villages from ISIS. They have broken the siege of Maria. So they have now connected with their comrades in Azaz. So they can get supplies by land, not just by, by air. And everyone in Maria wants to join the Mutasim Brigade, because all of a sudden, they're backed by the great superpower, the United States. So 400 is swelling to 1,500, to 2,500, to 3,000. And they want to just fight jihadists. But I, I just explained to you how the media essentially furthered a war against its, you know, the United States' sworn enemy. And why? It's because the US can do it's sort of like a, an idiot savant. It can do one thing very well, but at the expense of forgetting or neglecting everything else. And I said, 
You need, you need these guys on side. It's a Sunni Arab majority country. You need to empower them. You need to give them the weapons. You need to give them more than the weapons, that, that you have to build trust and confidence with, with them that the ISIS conspiracy theory is false. America does care about the majority in the Middle East. I mean, we talk about minority rights, and yes, absolutely. There is, ISIS has committed genocide against Yazidis. ISIS would slaughter every Shia it could ever get its hands on. It has a pathological hatred of the Shia. But Sunnis in Syria are the majority, and they have been barrel bombed. They have, been, they have had sarin gas dropped on their heads. They've had their homes set on fire with the families locked inside. They have been gang raped in Assadist dungeons. They have been crucified by ISIS. There are a lot of brave activists who still, they stand against all forms of totalitarianism. And they look to the United States and they say, we don't get it. In the beginning of this, this conflict, at the beginning of this protest movement, we were burning Russian, Iranian, Hezbollah, and Assadist flags. And we were waving, you know, America, please give us a no-fly zone, and nothing came. So again, the, the psychology, the, the, the belief that the US actually does care about its humanitarian principles. I don't mean by tweeting, you know, hashtag bring our boys back or bring our girls back. Actual fire and steel, you know, uh, backed up uh, action. That's what, what, what matters the most here. And I don't see that. And instead, I see a lot of, you know, frankly, bullshit and, and, and masqueraded policy, strategic communications, as the administration says. I mean, they're, they're claiming that the, the Kurdish paramilitary forces are now, they, there's, there's equal parity between the Kurds and the Arabs. This is, this is nonsense. Syrian Democratic Forces, they're mostly Kurds. And Kurds cannot march into Raqqa or Deir Zor because they're going to be slaughtered by Arabs because they don't want their territory being taken over by a minority. This is basic stuff. This isn't, you don't have to be a Middle East expert to get it. Um, but you talk to people in Washington and they just, they look at you like you have three heads. Speaking, or they spout these talking Speaking points. of people in Washington with three heads, um, if we could, and I, I, I'm just going to just let this be sort of an open question that we can start kicking around because I think we need to make room for other people to, uh, if anybody has questions to ask. Are you going to be animating this, Martin, or do you want me to keep an eye on people who put their hands up? Okay. Okay. The, uh, the prospects for any, any useful shift in American foreign policy in the region um, given the likely candidacies that are emerging from the Republican and Democratic parties. Go for it. Well, um, you know, look, I've, I've, I've said publicly, uh, uh, Donald Trump is a threat to national security. Full stop. Um, this isn't about partisan politics. This is, I don't care, you know, what your ideology. I mean, this, this guy is a dangerous imbecile. The things he's saying, the, the things he's just advocating, whether or not he makes good on them, we're going to build a I mean, well, build a wall for Mexico, but we're going to put a moratorium on Muslim immigration. If I'm Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi sitting there in Mosul, this is what I'm doing. Because my, my presentation, my argument is there is the land of unbelief and the land of Islam. And as I said earlier, ISIS, the Islamic State, is the only guarantor, the only custodian of Islam. You do not, I mean, listen to what the spokesman of ISIS, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, said in 2014, even before ISIS started to lose territory, Kobani namely. He gets out, he issues a communique, and he says, and this is, this is the foreign expeditionary wing of ISIS, which is now in, in growing increasingly powerful and is being led by Europeans. He says, um, you don't have to come to the Islamic State to build the caliphate or to take up you know, this project. You can stay where you are in your home city and when you see the kufar, meaning the infidel, you, you kill him. So you have a car, drive over him with your car. If you find a rock, take a rock, smash his head in. You have a knife, stab him in the heart. Um, that is your responsibility as a Muslim to, to the Islamic State and also to your faith. Um, Donald Trump is basically s seconding or, or encouraging the Adnani narrative, the Adnani propaganda. It's very interesting. Um, ISIS was cheering the Front National in Paris when they looked like they, were, they stood a chance of winning the regional elections, what, a couple months ago, all the ISIS Twitter followers are like, yes, we want Le Pen, because that's the, that's, that, that's, our, that's the ideal antagonist. That's the ideal enemy. We don't want the West to be inclusive and democratic. We don't want to see Muslims in positions of power. Um, because, I mean, it, it's no coincidence that when one of their last uh, propaganda manifestos, or their, their magazine, Dabak, which is published in English, by the way, they declared war on Western imams who they see as a bulwark against extremism. They, they want to liquidate any form of, of pluralism or integrationism 
or assimilationism within the ranks of the, the Muslim diaspora, the Muslim Arab diaspora well, in the let's West. Go, let's go with some little bit of, I'm going to say, what the hell, wishful thinking here, that, um, that the candidate will probably, the, the next president may be Hillary Clinton. No, this isn't an endorsement of Hillary Clinton, but there you are. What kind of prospects are there for your communities, for uh, a more rational um, uh, NATO engagement in the region mm -hmm. uh, in, in a Clinton ad administration? Well, I think our cause, from an aid perspective, it's a, it's a bipartisan. It's a humanitarian sure. issue. So um, that should be really, on both sides of the aisle, really addressed. And unfortunately, this uh, current administration has failed gravely to talk about that. From a um, political standpoint, the creation of a Nineveh Plain province for the minorities, and there is on your uh, tables, and there are a few copies outside, is, um, is a t uh, teaser white paper that we talk about, we are presenting for the first time in an organized way, what would a province look like? And luckily, or thankfully, uh, Clinton has spoken about this before. Uh, Trump has advisors that we're well connected to who advocate, who have advocated for this for 30 years. Um, so on both sides, if we look at the both parties, if we approach them in an organized way, there is a strong possibility that this could happen because because it would bring some sort of a stability in that entire region, and we could be considered an ally of Israel and, an al and a small ally of America. So on both ends, for us, I think, if we play our cards correctly, it could be beneficial. Okay. Questions, anyone? I'm waiting. There's lots. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Cal Itsu. Um, I'm with the Catholic Near East Welfare Association. We're an organization that uh, has been uh, present in the Middle East since 1926. We have three offices there, Beirut, Amman, and Jerusalem. And our work is really to work with Christians, all the Christians of the Middle East. And uh, I really uh, want to thank the presenter because this presentation is really concise, precise, uh, demoralizing a bit too. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, my question to you is, about um, uh, the future of Christians in Iraq and the establishment of a province in the Nineveh Plain. I, I personally, with all the experience I've seen, all the Christians I've talked to, in particular with the Assyrians, the Chaldeans, the Syriac, that have suffered so much, um, they don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. They don't see that happening because they're fighting on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Already the Iraqi government is trying to eliminate all mention of Christians in their constitutions. Um, now decree where Muslims that marrying Christians are going to, their children will become all Muslims. Um, you're not on the agenda of anybody, whether it's the U.S., even though you're saying that Clinton and others have talked about it, certainly not on the Canadian agenda, the Russian agenda, uh, the Iranian agenda, uh, the Syrian agenda. Uh, I just don't know how that can happen. And, and okay, personally, so like many... Yeah, that's it. Um, first of all, thank you for Kaniwa. They've done a great job on a northern, in northern Iraq. Uh, you support the Dominican sisters with clinics that they've established, and that's a group that we support, one of the groups that my aid organization supports as well. Uh, when you speak to the Assyrians and Chaldeans, the reason you hear that uh, defeated spirit, you see that defeated spirit, is because we've been betrayed over and over again, and uh, we don't know who to trust. However, we all believe that having a presence in the Middle East, a Christian presence in the Middle East, ex is extremely vital for world um, on, a, on a global basis. Because if you extract Christianity, we forget that Christianity is a Middle Eastern religion. It is not a Western religion. And the presence of Christianity is extremely important because we are the bridge of understanding between the Western Christianity Christians and the Eastern um, Muslims. And if you extract us from that region, although that's our ancestral homeland, our rightful homeland, you will create a breeding ground for even more fundamentalism that you see today. Um, we have not been on the agenda uh, of uh, the United States, although they've given us lip service for the last 10, 12 years. We are working very hard to change that. 
And th again, once again, my presence here is extremely important and uh, because I am on behalf of my nation, I'm seeking partners in the Canadian government to come along our side, the non-governmental organizations to come along our side. So the, yes, there's a demoralized spirit. However, we will not give up. And I speak on behalf of, I live in the diaspora and I'm displaced in the diaspora because of those atrocities but I am the loudspeaker for those who are on the ground in Iraq and Syria. Okay, we have a question here. Yes, Jacob Kovale, Carleton University. Thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. Uh, actually, my question slash remark ties in with the lady's uh, uh, remarks. And that is almost a century after the mandate system of the League of Nations, much more important than Sykes-Picot, there is an opportunity to uh, reconfigure the Middle East. And I'd like to ask the panel to refer to the possibility of establishing a Yazidi entity, independent, of course, politically, as well as under different lines, slightly, the Kurdish entity. And in that context, I'd like to ask that they broaden a little bit of reference to Turkey, Erdogan Turkey, and the way in which it is involved in this very uh, murky, uh, but to, in a way, hopeful opportunity that we may face. And one more issue which it ties into this is the issue of the migrants. And in that context, instead of Europe, I'd like to ask where is the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, in the context of dealing with a migrant issue from Syria eastward rather than westward? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just very briefly address that last bit first? You don't see Syrians trying to flee to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I think that pretty well answers the entire question. But maybe others might yeah, want to address it. But let's talk about, you've described it as the balkanization of yeah. the Middle East. A lot of people have talked about the reconfiguration of the boundaries post Sykes people. I mean, it's, it's happening, um, yeah. I don't want to say spontaneously, it's, it's happening from the bottom up. Um, and again, you know, the United States is unwittingly paving the way for the creation of a Kurdish autonomous region in northern Syria known as Rojava, what the Kurds call Rojava, um, which unlike the KRG, Kurdistan Regional Government in northern Iraq, which was essentially created you know, through the no-fly zone that was in place by NATO and the United States, um, is, will be beholden to the PYD or the PKK. Now from Turkey's interest, Turkey is a NATO ally, it has the second most populous army in NATO, um, that would be like, um, and, and you know, Erdogan, that's a whole other kit and caboodle in terms of his personality and uh, megalomania. But, you know, across the board of the Turkish security establishment, the way they put it is, it would be like, um, uh, you know, if we were to create an Al-Qaeda state in Mexico, so, you know, at the southern border of the United States. That's how they see the PKK. They have waged an insurgency, counterinsurgency campaign against uh, each other for 40 years on and off. There was a peace process that had been inaugurated, uh, rather ironically, in the midst of the Syrian conflagration. And remember, the Assad regime is very clever, much like ISIS actually, about preying upon geopolitical vulnerabilities or um, weaknesses in the enemies ranged against. So Assad actually withdrew a lot of his forces from the, the uh, northeastern Kurdish regions of Syria, knowing that the PYD would rise up and that this would antagonize and enervate uh, the Turks, because the Turks obviously are very gung-ho about getting rid of Assad. Um, I have at, let me put it to you this way. I mean, I, there's a, a senator who's on the uh, Senate uh, Intelligence, or uh, sorry, the Foreign Relations Committee, and I said to him, I said, you know, so the U.S. is presiding over, actively presiding over the creation of Rojava. You've got American special forces on the ground fighting with these guys, wearing the patches in some cases, and close U.S. air support. We're creating Syrian Kurdistan, which is inimical, inimical, hostile, inimical to Turkey's interests. Um, so if they succeed in expunging ISIS from their midst, they're still, still going to be there. In Iraq, we are tr looking the other way and trying not to actively coordinate with the Shia militia groups that are close to Iran, but essentially it's, it's what one uh, Sunni sheikh to to described to me as the Hezbollahization of Iraq an Iranian deep state being built inside Iraq, which is so far confined to the realm of security and military, but will eventually have its own political prominence. So much like Hezbollah has a political wing and a military wing and holds Lebanon hostage to its own caprices, the same thing is going to happen in Iraq. I said, so this is what the US is doing in the, midst, er, in the, in the, the course of trying to get rid of ISIS. 
you're presiding over the end of, I mean, Sykes-Picot is more synecdoche than reality, as you know. The borders weren't quite divvied up that way. But you're presiding over the next Sykes-Picot, except you don't have, you're not actually drawing it on a map. You're just blundering your way through and, and doing it. And I said, does America have a contingency plan for what emerges in, you know, from the ashes of ISIS? And he looked me dead in the eye and said, no. I said, well, what happens when you have civil war? What happens when Turkey invades Rojava? What happens when the Sunnis uh, fight with the Shia militias or the Peshmerga fight with the Shia militias? This is another sideshow conflict nobody talks about. The Kurdish uh, paramilitary, a stalwart American ally, they hate the popular mobilization units. Um, and they've, they've come to blows more often than, than, than we've seen in the Western press. This is what I mean. The, the, this is the end of the contemporary nation state. Now, from crisis breeds opportunity, right? Um, does that mean you can see the construction of a Yazidi or a Syrian homeland, or at least an enclave? Possibly. Um, I tend to be uh, a little more uh, downcast in my, my appraisal, only because this part of the world has never really gelled well to enfranchising minorities and to ceding territory. And there's another complication here. Uh, which Juliana can talk to more eloquently than I, which is, it's not, it doesn't quite do, it's not so, so cut and dried. I mean, when we talk about Sunni, Shia, Kurd, Assyrian, Turkmen, I mean, all along the, the green line, which demarcates the KRG region, essentially, from mainland Iraq or the rest of Iraq, you have villages and towns where it's, it's you know, 20% Kurd or 30% Sunni, 40% uh, Shia. I mean, these are integrated mixed communities. Yeah. What's happened in, in Baghdad, in the province of Baghdad, since the US war, has been a, a creeping ethnic cleansing campaign where Sunnis have been driven out. And it's become essentially a Shia enclave. Um, this has taken place all throughout Iraq. So what are you going to do to create a, either a de facto nation or a, a de jure one in the midst of all this crime. You, you're going to have to do population transfers. That's a very uh, radioactive 19th century concept. And, and as I say, it's happening now, but not with the consent and the guidance of any Western powers. I don't see Western powers actually signing on to this. So we'll get a plan B as soon as we figure out what plan A well, is. Well, exactly. <laughs> OK, uh, Juliana. And I think if Juliana could address this, we pretty well. One more question. OK, let Salma. Juliana address this point yeah. and then Selma. Selma will ask, and then yeah. we'll invite Brian up to the podium. Very good. And uh, everyone, uh, there's clearly lots of interest, so it's my hope that you can stick around a little bit. I know the speaker's planning. Yeah, uh, so very briefly. Can. Sure. Yeah. So we're not looking for a Christian ghetto. It's important for you to know that, that this is going, going to be for all of minorities. And this is something that Iraqi government officially has okayed in their constitution. It is in the constitution of Kurdish uh, regional government as well. Um, it is, uh, it's true. There, it, we are not looking to carve out an independent state. We want, we hope and strive for Iraq to remain intact. Uh, a lot of people think Iraq, or say that Iraq is a failed state. It may or may not be. But we cannot, I, we personally believe that we should not give up on it so easily, that we want this to remain a federal government, and we belong to this federated, you know, as a federated entity in northern Iraq. If, if uh, Nineveh Plain is freed by the Peshmerga, my friends, they will annex it and they will call it as a part of Kurdistan. And that will be the end of Christianity. Uh, that will be the end of the Assyrians and Yazidis there. It is important for people to know that Kurds are not anti-Christian. Ba'athist regime was not anti-Christian. Ba'athist regime said, as long as you're an Arab, Iraqi Christian, it's fine. But you're not an Assyrian Chaldean Christian. And people miss that the KRG, Kurdish Regional Government, has the same sentiment from a nationalistic perspective. So um, it's, not, it's a dotted line. So the, 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 the Turkmen Shiites, the Yazidis, and the Assyrians have lived, coexisted peacefully for all this time. They all, on a united front, are asking for the same thing. Selma. Hi, my name is uh, Salma Siddiqui, and uh, I'd like to name my organization. It's the Coalition of Progressive Muslim Canadian Organizations. A huge name, very small membership. The reason being that I'm a Sunni Muslim, and thank you for talking about me, but I am as much in danger as anybody else. I find you people my friends, and I think unless we want to work together in honesty, 
we will not go anywhere. The, and I'm talking strictly about Canada right now, the parliament, and the Sunni influence in the parliament. It's huge. Very few members, it's huge. How do we bring, uh, you know, uh, the political leaders to understand that there are many kinds of Muslims here, including in the Sunni Muslims, I could be an apostate because I talk what I believe in. So my qu uh, only thing, uh, uh, question is, and I'd like to thank Sija, uh, McDonald, uh, 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 Brian, and, and Fred, and all of you in bringing us out that early in the morning. <laughs> but it's worth it. How do we continue this work? And I'd like to see more Muslims here if we can bring in. And the next event you do, please ask us. We would like to partner with you. And uh, okay. not one hour doesn't do us uh, justice. It could be a whole day. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much. And count us in. Whoever we are, we are powerful in our, uh, in our uh, words, not powerful in our membership. Thank you. OK, let's go to Brian Lee Crowley. And and then maybe we can have that conversation that uh, Selma wanted to have uh, amongst ourselves as uh, this all wraps up. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, um, in the interest of uh, diversity, two quotations came to mind to me as I was listening to the very fascinating discussion this morning and uh, diversity in the sense that one of them comes from a bumper sticker and one of them comes from Winston Churchill. <laughs> the bumper sticker is, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. Uh, I think everyone in this room, uh, in, uh, in reaction to the passionate, informed commentary that we've heard from uh, both of our speakers, uh, felt not just uh, uh, intellectually challenged, but deeply emotionally moved by what we've heard. Uh, so the, 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 the quotation from Churchill comes from the Second World War in which uh, he said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they have uh, exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> and I think we are in the exhausting all the alternatives phase. Um, what's happening in the Middle East, and more importantly to the people of the Middle East, as we've heard today, is an affront to our common humanity, as well as storing up challenges for the West that we will have to confront sooner or later, uh, challenges that the current military operations in Syria and Iraq go some way to mitigating, but clearly do not resolve. Uh, the rise of ISIS and uh, extremist groups presents threats that uh, increasingly transcend national boundaries, uh, they come to Canada as well as uh, uh, the Middle East and uh, other Western countries. The Middle East's evolving security landscape poses great challenges for policymakers at large in ensuring stability, stability and managing the crises that we've heard about and some that uh, I'm sure we didn't have time to get into. Crises in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen, just to name a few, continue to generate grave political and humanitarian consequences. So please join me in thanking not only our two outstanding speakers, Michael and Juliana, with their courageous, insightful, and sometimes harrowing messages about this volatile region uh, and its significance to us even thousands of miles away, but also uh, please join me in thanking our discussion moderator, Terry Glavin, whose Orwell-like eloquence and commitment to unflinching honesty are an inspiration to all of us who work in the world of ideas. And I come bearing gifts for you all uh, on behalf of the crowd Thank this morning. Thank you so much. Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie? Well. Carrie? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. And the number of women he proposed marriage to in his final years. Oh. Awesome. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Oh, George. Uh, I'm very pleased to have had the honor of co-sponsoring this event. 
with two organizations for whom we at MLI have nothing but the highest regard, namely the Center for Jewish and Israel Affairs, and I particularly mention uh, Martin, uh, Sean, and Richard. Thanks so much for, uh, for um, working with us uh, on this or uh, taking the lead uh, uh, to a very large extent, and of course the Free Thinking Film Society and Fred Litwin. I'd like to also men uh, mention uh, Joanna uh, Roach, who is um, our Director of Administration at MLI. Um, both uh, the uh, Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs and the Free Thinking Film Society are uh, unwavering advocates for peace, freedom, and justice, both here at home and in the Middle East, and we at MLI couldn't think of better partners to have in an endeavor like this. Uh, if you're not familiar with MLI, we're a national think tank based here in the national capital, focusing on how federal power can be used in the interests of all Canadians, including in national security and defense affairs, and events like this are exactly the kind of thing that we want to bring to uh, the public in Ottawa and across the country. On behalf of all three sponsoring organizations, I want to thank you all for having been here this morning and participating so thoughtfully, so energetically and insightfully in our deliberations. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you. Have a great day.